But if you dream team, it's your boy D Neil back with another reaction video, guys. Here we are with how I see the US after living abroad for 15 years. Before we dive into this, y'all know I need y'all to smash that subscribe button, ring notification bell, give the video a thumbs up so it gets suggested. You guys got a favorite video suggestion, you can subscribe to Patreon or drop it in the comment section. And we are gonna break this video up into two parts. What we got? Things are still really expensive here. Like it's quite easy for me to spend more money on rent than my entire cost of living per month in Croatia or Portugal. I pay more Dang. for just utilities here than I spent renting a four bedroom house in a vineyard in Montenegro. Oh my God, I'm living in the wrong country. I'm in the wrong country. My God, she said I pay more utilities than renting a four bedroom house in Montenegro. Hold on, hold on. So this is a bit of a different style of video than I've made before on this channel, but I've been wanting to make it for pretty much the whole year that I've been back living in the US because I've basically spent half of my life living in foreign countries. So and cool. since coming back due to the global circumstances, there's just quite a few things that I've noticed that have either been intriguing me or bothering me or saddening me about what life in modern day America is like. So I just wanted to share some of these insights with you, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm <laughs> curious to hear your thoughts or if you agree. Mm. And I don't wanna offend anyone, but sometimes cliches and stereotypes are based in truth. And some mm. stereotypes about the US, I have come to believe are in fact quite true. So if you're new here, you're probably wondering where the heck have you been this whole time? Well, if you've ever lived abroad, you know that sometimes you say you're gonna go for one month or one year, but then you never come back. And that's pretty much <laughs> what happened with me. I lived abroad for the first time when I studied abroad at 20 years old. Oh, and wow. one semester turned into two semesters and one year turned into seven or eight, Dang. yada, yada, yada. Because Jeez. once I realized that I could live in foreign countries and typically for less money than it cost me to live Ooh. in the U.S., I just kept going. <laughs> Long story right. short, I've been to a lot of countries. I've learned a lot wow. along the way. And naturally, when you live abroad for a long time and then you come back to your home country, you experience some degree of culture shock. And uh, maybe we can all learn something from it. So whether these things are positive or negative or good or bad, you be the judge. I'm gonna try to be you. as objective as possible. Here we go. The I first thing that I noticed when I got back to the US was the consumerism mm. and materialism mentality of America. Everything is just so big, so expensive, so extreme, or so kind of like overdone and exaggerated from the cars to the roads to the shopping malls to the quantities of food that you get at restaurants to the selection of stuff that you can get at the grocery store and so the first thing i had was kind of this consumerism overload when mm. i got back and i spent so much money in the first two months that i was here just on going out to eat and groceries and like Ooh. buying stuff on Amazon. I mean, I had Ooh. been living in countries that didn't even have Amazon. Oh. And one time um, I had to mail some stuff from Bali and I had to actually mail it on a ship. Like it took three months to get to my oh, house. And, wow. and in the US, it's like you can get everything you want on demand and everything always yeah. has to be bigger and better and I guess that's part of the nature of like capitalism and competition and also the US having so much space to like expand and grow into, but everything is really larger than life here. <laughs> like mm. even today, it's been eight or nine months that I've been here and still when I walk into the grocery store, I'm still overwhelmed with the <laughs> selection mm. of stuff that's in there and snacks and impulse buys at the cash oh register when you're trying to leave. It's quite impressive the way that um, 
corporations and marketing experts have designed stores in such a way to really maximize the profit per square foot. It's really hard to get in and out of there without spending more money than you had anticipated. And usually when I'm traveling, I'm sad that there's only one brand of peanut butter. <laughs> She's not lying. Like I walk into the grocery store and we, I'm sure most Americans do this. You know what you need. You know what you need. But you get to walking through a couple of aisles and some things catch your eye. And you're like, huh, this could be interesting to try. Let's try this. Huh, I want to try this. this. This looks like it would be good. Let's, before you know it, you spent almost double what you came in there to spend. And so it, it, it happens a lot. Consumerism is huge. Materialism is huge in the U.S., big time. And also said, uh, like she said, you can get everything on demand, like... You know what I'm saying? If they're not selling in a store close to you, Amazon will have it on your doorstep in a day or two. <laughs> and so it's like, yeah, you're in a constant state of consumerism. I 100% agree with what she's saying, but uh, I'll let her keep going. Really, when I'm traveling, I'm sad that there's only one brand of peanut butter. <laughs> and I can <laughs> actually travel with certain things that I really like, like peanut butter, because mm. I couldn't get like the natural organic kind that I wanted. I used to travel mm. with like pharmaceuticals and all kinds of stuff that I was afraid that I couldn't get in other places because mm. everything is just so convenient and so available mm. in the US. But the other thing that started happening once I got back was I started feeling like I needed more stuff and that I mm. needed to kind of keep up with the Joneses more, mm. even though everybody was on lockdown. And even though I was like, I don't technically live here. It feels weird to be here without having a car, like walking around or riding my bike like I used to do in Amsterdam, which is totally normal. And then here it's like, there's like a stigma to it. So I don't mm. have a car right now. Oh. But even when I did have a car, I never used it because I just rode my bike everywhere because I liked it. Mm. I don't think a lot of Americans realize that status is like minimalized or kind of hidden. Like in the Netherlands, for example, where I've been living for on and off for a few years, they're not flashy with money. Mm. Like you wouldn't know if someone had a lot of money. Like everyone kind of wants to like blend in and even the royalty, mm. like even the king and queen are known for being quite modest. They'll like ride their bikes around, just wear oh, normal wow. clothes and whatever. And then in the huh. US, it's like everything is just flashier, yeah. more expensive, and the bigger the better. And so I have been feeling like there's more pressure to mm. like show off a little bit here. I found myself feeling like I needed to dress up more. <laughs> Like I needed to wear high heel shoes again for the first time in years and wear more makeup and stuff like that. And I started to wonder why. <laughs> and I yeah. think it's just because you become a product of your environment to a degree. It's not just- You find yourself, I don't, like she said, trying to keep up with the Joneses. You find yourself comparing yourself to, to others so much. You know what I'm saying? And it's like people like your peers around your age, and it's like, well, they, they've accomplished this and they got this and I don't. And so you you find yourself trying to compete with them and comparing yourself to them uh, to the point where, like, yeah, you start to get flashier things, even though you, you have no need for them. You don't need them. You don't need them. But you find yourself starting to get get, get the flashier things because it's like, well, well, all my peers got it. Like, know what I'm saying? Do it. I look left out. I look... Y'all understand what I'm saying. I'm just agreeing with you. Just that. because you become a product of your environment to a degree. It's not just the culture and society of consumerism. It's also the in-your-face marketing and advertising. Mm. Like the sheer volume of billboards and ads and commercial breaks <laughs> on TV and what they mm. are advertising for has been quite jarring. First and foremost, the pharmaceutical marketing and advertising. <laughs> it's illegal to advertise pharmaceutical yeah. drugs in I think every single country except the US. And so to see such a huge volume of commercials pushing drugs for people to like self uh, prescribe a drug from watching a commercial and then to go to their doctor and ask for that drug is just mm. very shocking. It's shocking that that's allowed 
and accepted. And then to see billboards like advertising the ER wait times, advertising <coughs> hospitals, like why would you want to advertise something like good about the ER? <laughs> Hopefully you don't have to go there ever. <coughs> I don't know, that kind of thing is really weird. And then equally, there's ads for a better, more efficient dishwashing detergent that goes in like the dishwasher. And I was thinking there's not even dishwashers in most houses in <laughs> countries around the world. And ads for dryer sheets. Like I mm. haven't had a dryer in years. There's not dryers mm. in Europe. It's very rare that you would have oh, wow. a dryer and a dishwasher in your house. So to see advertisements for like huh. dryer sheets and more efficient liquids that go in the dishwasher where you don't have to wash the dishes anyway is kind of surreal. Now this consumerism thing isn't something new to me because I remember when I was selling real estate in Costa Rica, I remember mm -hmm. these clients specifically that bought this beautiful ocean view lot and they were like, Ooh. we want to simplify, we want to move down to Costa Rica. And so they sold all of their stuff. Like they got oh, rid of wow. hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stuff that was in their house My in God. Massachusetts. And they moved to Costa Rica and they literally replaced all of their stuff. Like they built a three story house and oh, filled wow. it with more stuff. And they invited <laughs> me to come see it when it was done. And I was like, what is all of this stuff? And they had basically <laughs> imported their consumer habits <laughs> from the U.S. <laughs> to Costa Rica. <laughs> and they even brought a container of their stuff down too. So the stuff that they didn't wow. sell, they brought in a shipping container and paid a lot of import taxes and transported Ooh. it. And that just really stuck with me because I was like, this is not the definition of simplifying. <laughs> <It's> just <laughs> replacing the stuff that you already have. <clears throat> One of the biggest things I've noticed though is the price of everything. Mm. Like it really is more expensive to live in the US than most countries. Even in Florida, which is a tax-free state when it comes to state income taxes and we have a lower cost of living than a lot of other states, things are still really expensive here. Like it's quite easy for me to spend more money on rent than my entire cost of living per month in Croatia That's or crazy. Portugal or That's Costa Rica. Crazy. Like my rent while living abroad has been anywhere from 150 euro per month living in Bulgaria to like maybe two or three thousand dollars a month in a place like Australia Ooh. or Japan or Hong Kong. Oh yeah, that's a two, three K. You better be getting some bang for your buck. I couldn't afford two, three K. But a hundred and fifty? Oh, I'd be rich there. <laughs> I wouldn't say rich. I'd be, I'd be comfortable. I'd say I'd be comfortable there. That's it? A hundred and, oh my God. But in the US, like in my neighborhood, just looking around for like a one bedroom, unfurnished apartment in a nice area of Miami is like easily 1500 to 200 God, a month. Dang. And that, you have hundreds of dollars in your electricity. I don't know why I said it like that. The rent I pay in a small town that's not, I mean, I went to a good town. I guess it's not a bad town, bad part or bad town to live in, but I pay like 1100. So I don't know why I was got 15 isn't too far off from 11. And so, and she's in a, I, I feel like she's probably in a nicer place than I am. So that makes, that that's actually reasonable. I just couldn't afford that. Thousand dollars a month. And then on top of that, you have hundreds of dollars in your electricity bill and your internet. I pay more for just utilities here than I spent renting a four bedroom house in a vineyard in Montenegro. <laughs> that's and crazy. And what I pay that's for crazy. a furnished Airbnb here, I could get a two Ooh. or three bedroom furnished Airbnb on the beach in Mexico. So yeah, oh, the wow. cost of rent is more, the cost of utilities is more, the cost of insurance is more, the cost of healthcare is more. <laughs> My insurance policy is probably at least three to $350 per month with like a 10 or $15,000 deductible, 
or I could pay like a thousand dollars per year or even a few hundred dollars per year to get travel and emergency medical coverage with safety That's wing. It? So it's pretty crazy like wow. I just pay out of pocket to get medical treatment anywhere in the world. Like I'll pay $20 for a doctor's appointment in Thailand or Costa Rica or Nicaragua or something like that in the same thing here or the same procedure would cost thousands of dollars. Yes. Another thing I realized really quickly once I got here was That is insane. This must this why I don't y'all see why I, I'm just out here taking risks and living without health care. Because there's no way on the Lord's green earth I'm paying three hundred dollars in health care a month. I'm j I'd I'd rather risk it. I'd rather risk it was that the pace of life is significantly more intense in the US. I found that in other countries, people have more balance. At least people have a better quality of life and like a more sustainable pace of life that isn't so intense. Like the first time I went to Europe, one of the first things I noticed was the leisurely lunches and just so many people sitting outside and enjoying the weather, enjoying the daytime, mm -hmm. enjoying their food, enjoying a glass of wine or a beer with lunch. And that just doesn't happen in the yeah. US unless it's Sunday brunch or something. Even if you work from home, chances are you've probably eaten at your desk while working from home, even though you don't have to commute anywhere. And even though you don't have to like go downstairs <clears throat> to get food or go pick it up. And I think that that just comes from this ingrained workaholic American culture. On that note, regarding the food. I would say I work at home because of YouTube. But yeah, I, so, and I'm in an apartment, not a big apartment. So living room is like right next to where I'm at right now, right next to where I'm working. So after I finish recording videos, I mean lunch at the table in the living room. And I go from my computer to my laptop to upload and type in the descriptions and edit videos. And so it's like, Hurry up, scar some food down. After I record, now I'm editing. Now, <laughs> it feels, uh, sometimes this can get nonstop. It can get nonstop. Workaholic American culture. On that note, regarding the food, it's like the food just doesn't taste as good. I'm mm. not saying there's not amazing chefs and amazing restaurants, but the quality mm. of the ingredients is not good. A lot of the reason for that, I think, is because there are a few really big food providers. So everything mm. tastes quite uniform. Well, not mm. just the food suppliers, but also the factory farming, the GMO ingredients, the mass production. You can taste the difference in the food and there is a lack of flavor. And also mm. because in the US, convenience, consumerism, you can get any food, any fruit, any vegetable in or out of season at any time of year, as long as you wanna pay more for it. But that yeah. means that the food isn't as fresh or it's had to travel farther to get here. But in other countries, I've eaten a lot more seasonally and the food might be simpler, but it tastes better. Like mm. I'm convinced that kids would like to eat vegetables more if their vegetables came from Bulgaria. <laughs> like I spent quite a bit of time in vegetables. Bulgaria in the last couple of years and you can only get what's in season. I remember mm. wanting to get sweet potatoes and I had to drive to the capital of Sofia, like two and a half hours away. God dang. So I didn't just go for sweet potatoes. But okay. I made sure okay. to go to a big grocery store where I could find sweet potatoes because I was craving them and it was summer and they, they didn't have any. But throughout my travels, I have such vivid memories of specific foods that I ate my entire life growing up in the US, but that just tasted completely different mm -hmm. in that other country because it was from there, it was local produce, it was organic, it was in season. So whether it was a pineapple in Costa Rica or an avocado, or tomatoes and cherries and apples and plums and pears and peaches in Bulgaria. Mm. Pretty much everything in Bulgaria tastes good. Uh, they're yogurt too. <laughs> or mm. fish in Japan, Ooh. obviously. So fresh, so good. Arugula oh. in Italy, house cooked? wine in France. It's like when you get the product or the ingredient locally and it just grows there and it's in season, it tastes amazing. And when it's not genetically modified, and so I feel like I've been spending a lot of money eating out for like really mediocre food 
mm. that kind of tastes the same in every restaurant. It's weird. Ooh. And like another problem. That would be weird. Yeah, yeah. I don't eat out very much, but uh, I don't think, uh, I feel like she's pretty spot on about a lot of these things. I mean, obviously, I've never been outside the country, so I don't know how it is in these other countries, so I'm just going to take her word for how she says it is. Uh, but I do know about America, and I feel like uh, she's pretty spot on. That's all we got for part one, though. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Ring the notification bell. Get a video a thumbs up so it gets suggested. If you guys got a favorite video suggestion, you can subscribe to Patreon or drop it in the comment section. It's your boy, d -Nail. Out.